about another five minutes and if the reserve people don't show up then we'll have you come on down and take seats that are empty i'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for being here tonight we're happy to see so many folks here including so many seaside residents i was expecting dave pacheco but i don't see he's, him is he he's here? on his way he's on his way great so councilman dave pacheco is coming i see councilman dennis alexander is here uh, so we're is Jason Campbell here? We're expect we're expecting him, and he will be seated as a council member on Thursday. Tonight will be a very informative meeting led by Land Watch Monterey County. It's a professionally staffed nonprofit which was formed in 1997. Land Watch promotes economic vitality, environmental quality, and socially responsible communities. Please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of Landwatch Monterey County, Amy White. Thanks, Kay. I just want to, I, I really want to extend my thanks to Sustainable Seaside. This is something that Landwatch had wanted to do for a while um, in relation to, to Monterey Downs. And it's something that Landwatch has done for a long time, you know, CEQA workshops back when we were founded in 1997. It was, it was, it's really important to us that the community know what the California Environmental Quality Act is and how you can participate in land use planning. And so that's really the purpose of um, tonight. So I want to um, spend a, a second introducing the speakers. So Janet Brennan is going to speak after John, but I'm going to talk about Janet first. She has 30 years of planning experience. Um, she is one of the founding Landwatch board members, so she's been on our board for 17 years. Her experience includes air quality. Actually, air quality is really a specialty of hers. Land use, water quality, um, infrastructure, and hazardous waste planning. Um, she is currently the president of the League of Women Voters of Monterey County. Um, or wait, there's a new name. I know it's Monterey County. They didn't change the name. Um, so I, I, we're just really thrilled that Janet's not only on our board, but participates in such a big way in all of Landwatch's work. Um, so Janet's going to talk about how you don't have to be an expert to comment on um, environmental impact reports. And so first, um, John Farrow, we're really excited that John Farrow is here tonight. Um, he is uh, a member of the MR Wolf and Associates law firm. Um, MR Wolf and Associates is located in downtown San Francisco and Landwatch is actually one of their original clients and um, they've been representing us for as long as I've been at Landwatch anyway for seven and a half years. Um, so John was raised in Oregon. His mother was the first woman um, and became the first chairwoman of the Oregon State Fish and Wildlife Commission. And his dad was a founder of the Thousand Friends of Oregon, um, one of the original and very important land use organizations in Oregon. So it's actually totally appropriate that he went into land use law. And um, John, John and, and Mark Wolf are very good to Land Watch. We really appreciate their representation. And um, I'm excited to have him talk to you tonight. So I'm, um, there's a lot more I could say. I will say, and all of you know this, that the Monterey Downs EIR has not been released yet. It's been, um, it's been stalled for a long time. Um, they're expecting it to be released next week. Um, they were expecting it this week. They were expecting it last month. So tonight, we're not going to be able to offer um, a really in-depth um, representation of what's in that EIR, but what we can talk about is sort of in general what the potential impacts may be. But uh, the purpose tonight is just to sort of give you an overview of the California Environmental Quality Act, how you can use it as a tool to participate in land use planning in Monterey County, and it's just something that's very important to Land Watch. So um, I hope you enjoy tonight. There'll be time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and I, I did provide two handouts. So this one is an outline of what John's going to talk about. Um, this is an outline of what Janet's going to talk about. And what I will do, everyone signed in tonight with their, um, there's some up here. Um, everyone, if you signed in tonight with your email address or you did it through Eventbrite, I'll be sending out an email with a link to the YouTube video that will be made of tonight's presentations. I'll also send you a link um, with these two documents. If you, we only printed 70, so if you didn't get one tonight, you will be provided with one in the next couple days via email. And finally, before I turn it over to John, um, I brought copies of this book. This was uh, a book that Landwatch created 
back when we were founded, Gary Patton, our first executive director, who's a prominent land use attorney in Central California, um, got a grant to create this book. It's called Land Use and the General Plan, and it really talks about a lot of the concepts that John and Janet are going to talk about tonight. I think I brought about 50 or 60 copies. It's also on our website. It's a great, great book if you're just getting introduced to CEQA and just getting introduced to what EIRs are. So um, here it is. And there's actually some of our founding um, board members here tonight, some of the Land Watch advisors. For one is uh, Phyllis Muir. She was on our advising board when, uh, when we were first founded. So good to see you tonight, Phyllis. So thank you. I'll turn it over to John. I'm just going to take his chair. Hi. Um, so I guess uh, the good news is that they haven't gotten around to putting out the EIR. Um, and the bad news is, of course, I can't talk about it. Um, uh, so I'm going to keep what I had otherwise planned to say uh, shorter and maybe spend more time on, um, on questions. Do you want him to have it? No, no, with the table okay. speakers. Okay. Do you want to sit and speak? You can no, I'm actually more comfortable okay. on my hind legs. Um, so uh, just before we get started, uh, how many people in here work for Monterey Downs? Show of hands. Okay. Just, just want to know if we're all friends. Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I, just, it's important to be clear about that. Um, she was not happy. I, uh, I did it on purpose wanted to uh, uh, cover some of the stuff in this outline and I don't know what's all been handed out but this is what I, I don't have PowerPoint so we'll just kind of rip through this um, as, a, as an introductory um, uh, take on CEQA I think it's important to recognize that the statute's got substantive requirements and procedural requirements and uh, as a commenter you should stay abreast of what those are you should be aware of the fact that the substantive requirement under CEQA which is uh, unique to the California Environmental Quality Act other environmental quality acts <coughs> are primarily procedural they just require you to disclose what's going on they don't actually require you to do anything about it CEQA actually has a substantive mandate that uh, an agency adopt mitigation or adopt alternatives that address the impacts and so you should be aware of that and that, that is that's a key requirement um, and they need to uh, defend their substantive findings with um, uh, a certain amount of evidence and we'll talk about that but at the end of the process they need to have findings and they say we're going to make these impacts less than significant or somebody else is going to do it who has the authority to do it or we can't do it but there are reasons why we shouldn't have to do it because there are overriding considerations. So it's okay for us to go ahead and trash the environment in this particular case. There's procedural requirements, and those are, I think, uh, just as important. The idea behind the procedural requirements is, is that it's to, designed to encourage public participation and inform decision making by uh, the elected accountable uh, representatives. And that means that there are specific informational disclosures that need to be made in an EIR, both topics that have to be covered and formats for how they address it. And we're going to talk about what has to be in an EIR. And those are the grist for a lot of comments because whether, whether they meet those informational requirements or not is a, a key issue that frequently arises when people challenge EIRs. So there's two ways an EIR can mess up. First, they can fail to do the substantive mitigation or selection of alternatives or to make the findings that it's not feasible to do it. Or they can fail by not jumping through the procedural hoops. And those procedural hoops, again, are primarily the requirement that there be informational disclosures. Flip the second page. Um, this uh, is uh, a discussion of something that you probably don't need to know a whole lot about, but I want to just touch on it now because um, when you decide to do an EIR, when an agency decides to do the full-on uh, environmental review, it's supposed to rely on one of the abbreviated formats that are permissible in a CEQA, like uh, a mitigated NAG deck, for example. Um, there are some consequences that flow from that. Um, the most important is, is that they have to do a better job. They have to provide more evidence. They have to look at alternatives. Uh, but there is also, the flip side of that is, is that there is going to be more deference to the agency's factual findings. Once they do an EIR, as long as they have some evidence, some substantial evidence to support their conclusions, the court will say, that's fine, even if there's evidence that goes the other way. So on the factual question about whether a project is causing impact, whether things have been mitigated, or whether it's feasible, not to, uh, whether it's feasible to mitigate them, 
there's going to be a tremendous amount of deference to the agency's findings. And so the deck is stacked in favor of the agency once they decide to do the EIR. <coughs> it doesn't mean that they get a carte blanche. There has to be substantial evidence to support their findings, and that's been defined in CEQA. Uh, it means evidence, it means facts, expert opinion predicated on facts. But it doesn't include um, argument and speculation, um, and that those facts, most importantly, have to be in the EIR. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But that's, um, that deference uh, extends to the agency's factual determinations. It does not extend to whether or not the agency is following the procedural requirements, whether or not there's enough information. And so a lot of comments uh, can usefully focus on whether the EIR has complied with the procedural requirements, because there the court is going to say, look, we don't know anything about water quality, or we don't know anything about protecting birds, but we do know whether or not they have done the proper form of cumulative impact analysis, or whether they have come up with a reasonable range of alternatives. These procedural questions, the courts will uh, not allow the agency to simply run roughshod over them. So those are issues, so I, I, I guess my lesson here on this second page is look at the process stuff as closely as you look at the substance stuff. All right, so what has to be in the EIR? I'm going to talk about gee many things. Um, um, <laughs> Description, baseline, significant impacts, cumulative impacts, mitigation, alternatives, and then the business of commenting and, and responding. And then I have a few things I want to touch on at the end. Uh, so let's just jump in. Project description, first thing that needs to be in an EIR. They have to tell you enough about the project so that it can be evaluated. Typically, that would include the location. Whatever about the project may lead to impacts. Um, they also need to describe the project's objectives. And the reason that's important is, is that the objectives of the project are what frame the de definition of the relevant alternatives. If your objective of the project is to, for example, build a horse racing and residential facility on this particular plot of land of this many units and uh, with uh, these particular amenities, you have tailored a very narrow project description, which probably isn't going to permit you to examine any alternatives. The courts won't countenance that. You need to have a sufficiently broad set of objectives so that you don't foreclose all possible alternatives. But the objectives will typically be framed in ways that tend to bias uh, the decision maker toward your project uh, because they'll just simply include things that are unique about your project and then they'll say, these features of my project, these important objectives of my project can't be met by uh, any alternatives, so you therefore, this is the only feasible alternative. You should question that carefully. You should look at the objectives and you should think about the objectives when you evaluate the alternatives and see whether or not those objectives are really central to the project or whether they're peripheral. The courts will countenance, uh, will permit you to, uh, will require an agency to look at alternatives that don't actually meet all of the objectives, particularly those that are not central. So the, the definition of objectives is a thing that uh, uh, agencies and proponents can play games with, and you should be alert to that. Um, so a project description has to be uh, complete enough to support the analysis. And that means they have to say enough about what the project is so that you can actually tell. If, for example, they propose to build a big berm to screen something, you should, they should tell you how big is that berm, how, might, how many cubic yards of fill will be moved, um, uh, where is it going to be located, uh, what other kinds of impacts is it going to cause. Um, uh, if they're going to talk about traffic mitigation proposals, they should say, what are they going to put? Is there going to be one lane or two lane here? Is there going to be a signal? Uh, who's going to pay for it? Uh, these are things that have to be provided in enough detail so that you can intelligently comment on the project. The description has to be provided up front. Uh, one of the problems that we get into um, uh, in Monterey County frequently is this notion that the project description becomes very elastic and it changes throughout the environmental review process. And this has been found to, uh, as you can imagine, somewhat frustrate the public comment process. If you don't know what the project is, if it keeps shifting around, it's difficult to have uh, uh, informed public commenting on it. So you should be looking for a definition of the project that's fairly stable right up front. The project has to, they have to describe the whole of the project. If there's something that's, uh, answer, that's going to be done as a result of the project, uh, if they need to build a sewage treatment plant in order to build uh, this project, if they have to add uh, roadway capacity and the project is going to be required to provide that, that's part of the project and that needs to be described. And it has to be described in as much detail as the project itself is so that you can talk about the impacts. 
Okay, so next is this environmental setting, or as often called, the baseline. Um, the baseline is important because it's, that's what you measure impacts against. Um, uh, a baseline has to be more or less, uh, uh, it has to be specified for every resource area. So, so when you go through an EIR, you'll see chapter after chapter, one for each resource area, and they'll go through a format of, this is what the baseline, the environmental setting is, and in that they will describe um, uh, the physical conditions on the ground, typically as of the date of the project's uh, uh, commencement of environmental review. They'll describe applicable uh, plans, including the general plan. Uh, in this case, they will be talking about the base reuse plan. They may be talking about the uh, habitat management plan. All of those plans are applicable to this project, and they have to explain uh, whether the project is consistent or inconsistent with the provisions of those uh, plans. And the reason they have to do that is that inconsistency with the plan is often, but not always, often evidence of a significant impact. So if you have an air quality plan that says, um, here's how many tons of pollutants the thing can emit, uh, if you're inconsistent with that, that's probably a significant environmental impact. If you have a general plan that says, uh, here's our noise threshold, and you're generating more noise, that's probably a significant impact. But if you have a, a, a general plan policy about um, fostering economic development, being inconsistent with that doesn't necessarily generate impacts on the ground, so it isn't necessarily a significant impact. If you want to comment on that and make an issue out of that, you're going to have to connect that to an impact on the ground, because that's all that CEQA is concerned about, is physical impacts on the environment. It's not concerned with social or economic impacts, unless those impacts drive another form of impact. A classic example would be urban blight, a project that um, uh, a big box store that kills off the competition, uh, that's an economic impact, but it has a, a secondary impact, which is that uh, you have urban blight as a result. So if you can make that kind of connection, you may have uh, an issue there. So in this case, the relevant plans, again, are going to include the seaside general plan, the base reuse plan, and the uh, habitat conservation plan, as well as uh, a host of other plans that are potentially involved. There is um, a complex uh, relationship in this case between the base reuse plan and the general plan. Um, under California uh, planning and zoning laws, there's a well-established hierarchy uh, where the general plan is at the top. A project has to be consistent with the general plan. If there's a specific plan, that has to be consistent with the general plan. The project has to be consistent with the specific plan. Then there's zoning. The project has to meet that. But the zoning has to be consistent with the higher plans. There's this hierarchy of plans. The base reuse plan logically, nominally, and probably sits at the hierarchy of all of these plans. And therefore, <clears throat> these plans should be consistent with the base reuse plan. But there isn't a lot of law here because base reuse plans are um, a creature of recent statute. And uh, uh, the uh, FORA has taken um, uh, an elastic uh, pos position with regard to uh, the priority of general plans and the base reuse plan. And in some cases, they seem to be implying that the uh, local general plans are the umbrella plan and not the uh, base reuse plan. This is an interesting and intricate legal question that I would not encourage you as lay uh, CEQA commenters to spend too much time thinking about. Um, uh, because uh, it's not going to go directly to a question uh, that, that I think we can make a lot of traction with as, as lay commenters. Um, OK. Next, uh, the, the heart of the EIR is really the determination of whether there are environmental impacts. Uh, surprisingly, um, <laughs> there's very little you can do here because that's a place where there's tremendous deference to the agency. It's a question of judgment. Um, they do have to base it on facts and analysis. They have to present those facts and analysis in the EIR. A conclusion by itself without support doesn't count. And as a commenter, one of the most important and useful things you can do is to say, I don't get it. Explain why you think this. And the more questions you raise, the more responses they have to provide, and frankly, uh, the more opportunities uh, they have for tripping themselves up. And one of the things that is very clear that the courts will do is they will agree that when you say X and then you later say not X, that's something that the court is willing to step in and say, wait a minute, that's not substantial evidence. A contradiction, as we all know, uh, it you know supports all conclusions. And so. When you ask questions, when you ask for the facts and analysis behind something, you're doing a real service. They may provide them, they may not, but it's 
it, it serves the purpose of getting the information out to the public that these uh, uh, conclusions are based on. Um, so when they do a significance analysis, they typically will advert to some sort of thresholds of significance, and they will actually identify them in most cases. In some cases, they don't do that, and if they don't do that, you should ask, what is the threshold that you're using? Um, there is a, um, a document out there called Appendix G to the CEQA uh, guidelines, which has a kind of generic set of thresholds of significance, which are qualitatively stated, not quantitatively stated. Uh, agencies will often list those. Um, uh, those are uh, of, of little value uh, uh, until they've had some numbers assigned, so they can talk about loud or excessive noises. Usually they fill that in with the general plan. They say, this is what our noise standard is. They talk about uh, traffic impacts. They'll typically fill that in with the level of service requirement from the general plan. So you need to see those uh, thresholds fleshed out. If they don't specify what they are, um, ask them. Now there's certain kinds of impacts where uh, they don't lend themselves to a quantitative threshold, and very typically those are going to be biological impacts. Um, those are very difficult uh, for an agency to, to quantify. So uh, frequently, the analysis of, of, of the significance of the impacts under biological resources is a very difficult thing to get a handle on. One thing that you can, you can look at is, is this project consistent, in this particular case, with the Habitat Conservation Plan? And if it's not, then I think that's kind of a prima facie problem. However it is, um, that may not by itself be sufficient. One of the rules in CEQA is, is that mere compliance with a standard doesn't let you off the hook if there's evidence that notwithstanding that compliance, you've still got a problem. So you shouldn't accept the agency's blanket statement that, well, here's the noise standard, we meet it, therefore we don't have a noise problem. Maybe the noise standard is phrased in terms of 24-hour uh, hour average noise, and the project will generate short, loud noises in an interval, and they don't have a standard for that. You, you point that out and say, notwithstanding the fact that you're in compliance with this standard, you haven't really gotten yourself off the hook. And so you should be thinking outside the box. Just because they advert to a standard doesn't mean that's the only relevant standard. And you should feel free to say, you've considered this, but how about this? Here's another kind of impact that you haven't considered. <clears throat> the determination of whether an impact is significant or not is critical because only if they determine it to be significant do they have to do something about it. And so that's why I call this the heart of, of the EIR. Um, they are going to um, uh, get a lot of deference. And the place where, again, the courts will give a lot of deference to the agency's determinations. The place where they get tripped up is if they fail to provide enough information, fail to disclose the facts that they're an analysis that their decision is based on, if there's no clarity, I mean, if, if they simply, you can read it and you can't make any sense out of it, say so. Say this doesn't make any sense. Put it in smaller words. Um, explain it to us. Um, if they're inconsistent, if they say X and not X, they've got a real problem there. Um, so let me just talk briefly about cumulative impacts. It's an area where many, many EARs um, simply fall short. Um, the typical approach to cumulative impacts in a lot of EIRs is to give a couple of paragraphs at the end of a discussion of the impact itself. Um, uh, the reason that you have to do an analysis of cumulative impacts is that um, under CEQA there's a recognition that impacts, environmental impacts uh, uh, accumulate gradually and a project by itself may not be the uh, uh, create a significant impact, but it may be part of uh, death by a thousand cuts. And, so they actually are required to do a distinct analysis in which they first make a determination, do all the projects that exist now and that are foreseeable in the future, will those all taken together cause a significant impact? And if so, does this project make a considerable contribution to that? Now this threshold for what's a significant impact and then the thresholds that are used for cumulative analysis should logically differ. Um, and in fact, case law is pretty clear about this. They recognize that an impact, a project may not have an impact by itself, but it may nonetheless have a considerable contribution to a significant impact. Classic examples, traffic and water. The project itself isn't, gonna, isn't responsible for the traffic uh, congestion on, on uh, State Route 68, but it may contribute to it. The project itself is not responsible for overdrafting the aquifer, but it may contribute to it. Those impacts, and, and air quality is another place, and global warming, those are all 
quintessentially cumulative in, in nature. Even noise is, is, is frankly often a, a primarily, a, a tra traffic noise is typically a, a cumulative problem. So they need to go through the exercise of doing the cumulative analysis, and that requires them to say, what is the geographic scope we're looking at? Why are we limiting it to this particular area? And you should think about whether or not they've done that, because quite frequently they don't. Um, they should, in the uh, geographic scope, they should explain what projects they're looking at uh, in the past, uh, and that should be everything that's on the ground right now, and what is the foreseeable future projects they're going to consider. And they, the basic rule is, is that anything that has, for which an application has been received or is an environmental review should be included in that. Um, they may choose to do a cumulative analysis with reference to a general plan as, or some sort of a planning document as opposed to a list of projects, and they can do that as well. But they need to have a defensible uh, definition of what are the relevant projects in this cumulative universe. Then they have to make the determination, do we have a significant cumulative impact? And then they have to make that second step determination, does this project make a considerable contribution to it? All this stuff is information that has to be disclosed in the EIR. If it's not there, complain. If it's not there, if they haven't done an adequate cumulative analysis, ask for it. Okay, mitigation. Um, once they've determined that there are significant impacts, um, they have to propose mitigation. Um, the, 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 the language I put in here is that the EIR proposes mitigation. Uh, an agency in their final findings for the project is free to either accept it or not, uh, but if they accept it, they have to impose it as conditions on the project. And in their findings, they have to explain that, uh, that that mitigation is, is effective. Um, Mitigation is only required for significant impacts. You can't impose it for less than insignificant impacts. Um, it requires so-called nexus and proportionality, which means that you can't expect one project to solve the cumulative impact problem. Um, it, it should solve problems that it causes and in proportion to its own impacts. Occasionally, you'll see an EIR say, we can't fix this because it's, uh, or we shouldn't be required to do anything more because anything more would be disproportionate and it would be infeasible because we wouldn't be allowed as a matter of law to impose this burden on our project. Um, when you're commenting on an EIR, feel free to suggest mitigation. The EIR is itself the first source of proposed mitigation, but public comments are just as valid a source of proposed mitigation and one of the things that a final EIR needs to do is to respond to any mitigation <coughs> proposal that you make. If you've made a facially feasible mitigation proposal for an impact, they need to address that. They need to either adopt it or explain why they're not going to adopt it. Mitigation has to be enforceable. One of the things that you find quite often is that they'll have a discussion of an impact and they'll say, here's some features of the project which are going to reduce that. Uh, and therefore we conclude that this impact won't be significant. Those project features are not identified as conditions on the project, they're not identified as mitigation, and they may very well not be enforceable. One of the things that you should point out is that this analysis appears to be relying on a project feature which is not an enforceable condition of the project. This needs to be made an enforceable condition if that's the basis for your conclusion. Mitigation um, is frequently so-called deferred, the formulation of the mitigation is frequently deferred in an EAR, and that's something to look at. Um, there are, well, the, uh, there's lots of case law on this, but the general rules here are that you have to say why you're deferring it. it you're, you basically, the one reason for deferring the formulation is we don't know enough yet about what the project's going to look like or what conditions are going to be to actually say exactly